The settings, the backwoods of the American South and the chic art galleries of Fifth Avenue and Soho in New York. The artists, almost all black, uneducated, poor, and talented. The dealers, white, sophisticated, and well-off. The mixture is a bitter potion of anger, disappointment, profit, and charges of exploitation. When we first broadcast this story a couple of years ago, we began with an artist from Pink Lily, Alabama, who called himself the Tin Man. In The Wizard of Oz, the Tin Man's complaint was, if I only had a heart. Our Tin Man has one. His complaint is, almost everyone he meets doesn't. His real name is Charlie Lucas, 41, father of six, barely able to read or write. This is the magic part of it. From childhood, he felt magic in his head and in his hands. He expressed it by making art out of junk. The folks in Pink Lily thought he was crazy. I told him I said, I'm finna do this thing here about the Tin Man. And people from all parts of the world are gonna come to see me. And they're gonna write books about me. They're gonna put me on television. They say, oh, you need to go back to the doctor. Instead, he kept going back to the junkyard, and he was right. He's recognized as one of the important artists in America, in an area critics and tastemakers find hard to define. I call it tinkling. I mean, they call it self-taught or naive, folk or primitive art. Quite simply, it is art. Everything has the magic in it. The Tin Man's pieces sell for Everything. several thousand dollars each. There are others like him all through the South, men and women driven to create out of their environment or faith or imagination. Jimmy Lee Sutton, who paints with mud. Bessie Harvey, whose mind's eye finds powerful faces in the twisted limbs and roots of trees. Lonnie Holly, Michelangelo in the woods. And Thornton Dial, who creates massive three-dimensional stories out of anything he can find. His wife, Clara, thought he was nuts. I told her, I said, Clara, I said, this hell make a million if I just could sell it. I'm just sick of that shit. Get it out of here. <laughs> he kept at it. Throw it out the door. His works now sell for more than $100,000 each. Did you ever have an art lesson? No. I never had nothing like that. The only lesson I got, I got it from God. So that's the way I got it. I get it like that. The works of all these artists are in some of the most important galleries in America. They're called outsiders because they live outside the overheated capitals of world culture. Within the milieu of his environment. And they don't speak the modish language of modern art. And abstract art, which is really imbued with an underlying narrative. Most of them don't know much about the business of art either, which is what went wrong in almost every case. Beginning with the Tin Man, Charlie Lucas. Has the art world been kind to Charlie Lucas? No. I've been treated like a dog in it. All the pieces that you've sold, though. I wasn't paid fairly for them. And some of them I didn't get paid at all for them. The first person to recognize the power in Charlie's work was an Alabama Supreme Court justice named Mark Kennedy, who had a business on the side dealing in art. He talked the Tin Man into signing an exclusive contract, giving the judge the right to sell Charlie's work. We were the agent for Charlie Lucas for a while, yes. Mm -hmm. The four-year contract. Right. Charlie had placed his full faith in the white establishment, in a judge no less, but he could not get the distinguished jurist to tell him what happened to the art that was taken away or how much it sold for. Judge is a powerful man in these parts. Oh, yes, he's a, he's a powerful man, and he's a wonderful man, too. But that ain't got nothing to do with showing me the books, though. I mean, I feel honored to know these people, but I don't feel right that my work was taken away from me the way it was. Do you know how much they got for some of those pieces? No. Never know anything. Do you have any idea? It's been kept away from me. Most of the work ended up in the hands of a few collectors who paid anywhere from a few hundred to ten thousand dollars per piece. The judge denies Charlie's accusations, says he kept him well informed, and showed him the books. 
but he says he couldn't keep track of all the art. There were so many people coming to Charlie Lucas's house and taking art from him that we never knew about that I agree with you. There was a lot of art out there that Charlie, that got away from Charlie that he probably never did get an accounting for. Uh, I've learned an important lesson about what happens uh, when artists are discovered and they become commercialized. And uh, it's not a very pretty picture. Judge Kennedy helped paint that picture. There was his relationship with another artist, Mose Tolliver, Mose T. He signed a contract with the artist which gives the judge full rights to reproduce his work on t-shirts and gives the artist a, quote, consideration. Mose T cannot read, and he insists he never signed it. Did you have a, a contract with Mose Toller? No. Of, of any kind? A contract, a written contract with Mose Toller, no. Well, there's this agreement about <clears throat> reproducing Mose's work on T-shirts. You... We never had a contract with Mose as it related to um, the sale of his art. We were contacted by some individuals who wanted to, uh, out of Birmingham, who wanted to uh, print reproductions of T-shirts on Mo's top of Moses work. It says he shall get a consideration. That sounds like exploitation. You don't write out how much money man's going to get for a consideration. I mean, you're a judge, a lawyer. Isn't that vague? A consideration could be anywhere from a dollar a year to Well, the a interesting thing about that, Mr. Safer, is number one, there were never any t-shirts produced. Most Tolliver and I were friends and continue, I think, to this day to be friends. He also says he never signed this. Well, Mose did sign it. Now, it may have been when he uh, uh, may have been uh, uh, less than uh, sober, as he was sometimes, but Mose did sign that. Judge Kennedy, for all his prominence, is a relatively small player. You just, you know, the you king of outsider art is an Atlanta dealer named Bill Arnett. He roams the back roads in search of the undiscovered. He's acquired works from the Tin Man's Garden of Iron Delights. The inside of his house is stacked and piled with art. He covets it, hoards it, admits he's a fanatic. The first rule of the art world is there are no rules. I, I, I agree with that. And, and unfortunately, that gets magnified in this sort of gothic deep south setting uh, in which traditionally the culture from which the work comes that we're interested in has been there for the taking. Uh, there wasn't a fee. It just simply took uh, a, a request. I want that. Give it to me. Yes, a boss. Bill Arnett has paid thousands of dollars to artists like Charlie Lucas. He claims to be the first dealer to give the artist a decent break. Bessie Harvey, once a favorite of Arnett's, would disagree. Well, when he first came to see me, he bought maybe a thousand dollars worth of work, and uh, which would would have been how many pieces do you think? <laughs> uh, the back of his van would, you know. Like a lot of artists he worked with, he paid her a monthly stipend of five hundred dollars over a five month period as an advance payment for an unspecified number of pieces. He bought a lot of work from me. And uh, well, he borrowed some when he was going to have this thing at his house. And uh, he owed me for some he had bought. He didn't pay for what he had bought, and he didn't give me back what he borrowed. I, I can't imagine why I would take a few of her pieces and not pay her and risk you know, being exposed on national television. I don't think I'm that dumb. But did you But did you borrow some pieces no, from Bessie? No, I, I bought pieces from Bessie Harvey for more money than anybody ever bought pieces from Bessie Harvey for. I then took a few more pieces, of, I think three pieces, for an exhibition in my house, which Bessie Harvey attended in 1988. Do you still have them? I have, the, I have some Bessie Harvey pieces that are... The pieces in question... I have, yeah, you mean, have I sold them or disposed them? Yeah. No, I have them sitting in a warehouse. Why not just send her the pieces that you have and, and it'll be over? I've got my own way of doing things, and I'm not sure what I really do owe her, if anything. He kind of got frustrated with me, 
And he came and he told me he wanted me to take the hex off of him. The hex? Yeah. And uh, I said, I don't have a hex on you. I said, you put a hex on yourself because you don't treat people right. Whatever one may think of Arnett, he did help put outsider art on the map. But Bessie Harvey says he has a need to control the artists. And if he can't, he'll try to minimize their importance. His current favorite is Thornton Dial, for whom he's arranged shows in New York and France. Dial lives in a big rambling house in rural Alabama, where are those who accuse Arnett of having total control over him. I don't fool with nobody but Bill Arnett. You don't let you don't let the collectors come in here. Nope. Nope. No Bible but Bill. Did you ever think that, nope. that no. One of Thornton Dial's paintings would go for a hundred thousand. Never thought that in my life. <laughs> Never thought I'd make that kind of money. Mm -mm. How much did you make out of that one? Well, I get part of it. You know, I get. I, I'm being satisfied with what I get. So. You don't want to say how much? Mm -hmm. yeah, well, no, I won't just say how much I get. This success so, of yours, you know, this house here. We're exactly the truth. You're on that house? Uh, that's true. That's mine. Thornton Dial may think he owns the house. He doesn't. We're not sure what Arnett told him, but at the county courthouse, records show the sole owner to be Bill Arnett. The house that Thornton Dial lives in. Right. He says it's his house. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, it's your house, is it not? It's, the house is in my name. Uh, when we bought that house for Dial, the house is, was essentially his house. I mean, it was bought for him by me. I didn't owe him the house. We then tried to transfer a title to him, and the accountant said, but if you do that, he's going to have a huge tax liability. And so some structure is being set up now whereby the house is his or in his name, but not uh, all at one time. But do you see where now where people, when people say Bill Arnett is controlling Thornton mm -hmm. Dial? Mm-hmm. There's no heavier control over a man than the, than the roof he lives under. Uh, in the case of Dial, he, he gives scarcely a thought to the taunts, and believe me, he gets them that, hey, Whitey has your house, or Whitey's taking control of you. This comes from within his own community as well as from outside. Long before there was any market for their art, Charlie and Thornton Dial and Bessie Harvey and the others were making art simply because they had to, unsullied by fashion or popularity. Now it seems that purity has been lost. Purity, yeah, well, that's an inevitability, is it not? I mean, you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't leave all this art on the road out there and only a few people get to go see it. You have to bring it to the public. It's an old conflict, the war between the dealer and the artist. In their lifetimes, Rembrandt and Van Gogh probably heard one version or another of Bill Arnett's spiel, and themselves voiced one version or another of the Tin Man's complaint. When you see your work again and it's sold for thousands and thousands of dollars, and you only got $85 for it, there's something in the system wrong, man. Bad wrong. An update. Bessie Harvey died last winter. She never did get back those three sculptures borrowed by Bill Arnett.